For 10 years, Paul and I have been longing to visit the Dalmatian coast of Croatia. There's over a thousand islands and miles and miles of protected water for sailing. We've sailed all the way from Canada, and at last, we're here. Cruising Croatia! I wanted to break away to see the world. I longed for excitement, the romance of travel. So we built a boat. And now we travel the oceans. Join us as we voyage to distant shores. We entered the Adriatic Sea in early June and planned to spend most of the summer cruising the Dalmatian coast of Croatia, formerly a part of Yugoslavia. There are nearly 1,200 islands extending for almost 300 nautical miles along the Dalmatian coast. For the next three weeks, we'll be sailing from the southern islands around Dubrovnik to Stone and then north to the Kornati Islands and Telashika National Parks, the most remote and wildly beautiful islands to be found in the Mediterranean. Well, this is looking like a pretty nice spot for a lunch stop. What we're going to do is put the anchor down. Now I'm going to swim over to the rock over there and attach a line to it. And that'll hold us, because otherwise we could swing out and hit one of those rocks over there. So we've only just got the anchor down. I'm going to swim ashore and pull it over, and then we can bring the stern in. Tying a line to the shore off the stern is a common technique in the deep water anchorages of the Dalmatian coast. That looks good, how's that? This is perfect. I can just put a couple of wraps around this rock so it won't chafe the line, and then you can tighten it up. Okay, I'll take it in a bit. Now that the boat is anchored securely, we head out into the bay with the dinghy to check on something out there we noticed as we were sailing in. We saw this thing rising up out of the water a little too close for comfort off our port beam. It's an unmarked reef. Wow, that's a hazard to navigation. We came closer than we meant to to this on the way in. It's just right in the middle of nowhere. It's 25 meters deep around here and suddenly half a meter. We could almost run aground in the dinghy here. There's lots of little fish. Oh, I want to go diving. Wow, it just goes straight down. It's a great place to explore. Diving down by the pinnacle, I find a dramatic change in temperature. Just below nine meters, there's a thermocline, a boundary between two layers of water of very different temperatures. All of a sudden, it's more than six degrees cooler. There are so many fish here, and even if you can't hold your breath and go deep, just swimming at the surface, you'll see lots of beautiful marine life. That anchorage was very, very lovely. I think that's why it's easy to charter around here. You can get a boat, and there's just so many options of places where you can take it to anchor for the night. Today we're heading to the village of Ston. We've had a bit of a wind shift, so the protection is better there. But it is going to be a bit of a navigational challenge. Right now we're in the Stonski Channel. We're going to have to watch for the shoals along the side and very carefully follow the channel markers to the town at the end. Ston looks like a pretty interesting place to visit because in the 1300s, the town was fortified to protect its treasure. What's the depth? It's only three and a bit meters. It's pretty shallow in here. Well, we got through the first two okay. Yeah, now the tricky bit. Make a couple of long runs between marks and it's really shallow on each side. I think we're going down a little ditch here. Now the depth here is about four and a half meters, so we're okay. We need about 1.8 meters. So we have two meters under the keel sliding along. I like exploring this kind of place. Sneaking up little rivers. It's very protected from the wind too, so we should have a nice quiet anchorage here. 
started construction of this wall in the 1300s to protect the town and the treasure. It turned out to be about 5.2 kilometers long, which is still intact. So what was the treasure that all this wall was built to protect? Salt. In the 1570s, Dubrovnik earned two-thirds of its income from these salt pans. Salt. The second treasure is the huge oyster bed in the bay at Malistan, where it's restaurateur Aunt Radic uh, shows me how oysters uh, are harvested. The currents in, in the summer, bringing these small uh, oysters and then they're catching on these nets. Then Aunt and his father-in-law take me out in their boat to show me how the oyster seedlings are then attached to floating lines in the bay. We approach using the oars so we don't foul them with the propeller, and then they're pulled up and hooked on the side of the boat for examination. This is the first which was in the, in the nets, and now it's come to the rope, you see? Oh. Separating them out makes room for them to grow. They are connected by cement. So you put two together? Yes. Yeah. The lines are checked daily, and they grow to restaurant size in about three years. These are one year old. The day of harvesting, they're cleaned on this special grating to remove any growth and taken off the lines. Then it's time for sampling at Aunt's restaurant, Bistro Stagnum. This coast is famous for its excellent seafood, and in stone, you can get the best oysters. Fabulous. My goodness. So, I'm going to need some lessons on how to eat these. Would you join us yeah. and show us how yeah, it's course. done? Okay, the first time get some of this nice lemon here. Fresh lemon, right That's from right. the tree where we're sitting. And you had to take like this to go the tree. Oh my goodness. So I put some lemon. Am, am I really going to be able to do this? We'll <laughs> see. Uh, okay. Will you demonstrate? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is how we used to do that. Okay. Like just take this. Oh, and you just kind of grab it off the shelf. Okay. I'll try the next one. Yeah. <laughs> I've avoided the first one. <laughs> okay, here goes, folks. They're quite delicious. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think you should try some, Paul. Or I'm going to finish all these. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, now we'll go, go with the knife in, inside. Okay. Just oh, yeah. push it and following the shell. Oh. Get to get it. Hey, okay. I did it. Yeah. Okay, just now open it. Hey, this is great. No one's going to pay me by the hour to do this. <laughs> Did I get okay, the wrong way? Again, wind? destroy, you see, all this. Again, destroy it. Mmm. <laughs> it is kind of gooey, but it tastes good. Wow, this is a great day of sailing. Normally the wind here comes from the northwest, which would be right on the nose for us. So when we get a wind like this, it is a great opportunity. This wind is called a yugo. Every wind around here has a name in the Mediterranean, which means a south wind from Africa. So we're sailing wing and wing. That means we've got the jib with the pole holding it out on that side, and then we've got the main sail tied out on the other side, and the wind is right behind us. And it is a great sailing today. Well, we just got a forecast that there's going to be a Bora tonight. This is a strong northeast wind, so we're glad we've got the anchor set, but that sky is looking dark and imposing. Well, the wind is still gusting. We had quite a night here in the anchorage. Three of the boats here dragged the night and had to leave, but 
Our anchor is holding well and we're staying clean for the day. As the wind speed increases, the force on the anchor rises dramatically. The wind speed doubling, say from 20 knots to 40 knots, actually results in a four times increase in the force on the boat. To see if we're moving, we use the GPS satellite system to monitor our position. The plotter is so accurate it shows the boat swinging around in a radius at the end of the anchor chain. If the anchor dragged, we would be able to see it on the plotter before we had moved 20 meters. So a bora is a wind coming from the northeast and it is the worst wind around here because it comes over the mountains. So when it does, it'll come in gusts where the normal wind might be 35 knots, which it, this is probably more. The wind is just whipping the waves right off. The top of the wave caps are being whipped right off into spray. There's no way we can even get in the dinghy. We just saw another dinghy float by, but torn right off the end of, uh, end of the boat it was being trailed by. So stuck here for a little while longer and not enjoying it. It's boring. I'm going to go and try and rescue the dinghy here. Our neighbors in the next boat, the dinghy was flying through the air and then broke loose. And it looks like it's washed up over on the beach. So I think I'm going to try and take ours to see if I can go and rescue it. Our neighbors are now stranded on their boat, unable to make it to shore without their dinghy. The weight of our outboard motor and fuel tank keep our dinghy from flipping in the gusts. Step one, getting it off the beach, is looking good. By keeping his weight forward, Paul reduces the chance of the gusts catching our dinghy, but our friend's dinghy is another matter. These gusts are over 40 knots. The rescue is a success, and our neighbors are very happy to see Paul. They figured their inflatable was gone forever. Exciting day out here. Well, we've got a lot of wind left over after that bora went through. So we're stuck in this anchorage for another day or so, and today is my grandmother's birthday. So I wanted to go give her a call. There's no phone here, and the magic mobile phone has no signal for the first time uh, probably ever. So we're going to have to go and climb up the mountain, I think, and see if we can get some sort of a signal oh, on the other side. islands have been inhabited since Neolithic times and in fact they were even colonized by both the Greeks and the Romans because at that time they were thickly forested. The wood was used for shipbuilding especially by the Venetians. The locals used it for firewood and the farmers burned huge areas so they'd have grazing land for their sheep and goats. But as the forests were cleared, the soil eroded, leaving this beautiful but barren limestone landscape. Right, so now that the destruction is complete, it's been declared a national park. Surprise. Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm doing fine, Gran. How are you getting on? Yes, I've seen a lot in life and enjoyed a lot, and everything's wonderful, especially today. That's great. Love you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Paul. Be a good boy. Bye bye. Come 
behind the islands here, we've got a protected channel with flat seas and some strong wind for sailing. This has got to be the most fun sailing place around. Run down and out with the boat! Yes! Great! Yes, we sailed across a couple years ago. Your boat looks great! Let's do it, man. Well, thank goodness that Bora is finally over. We moved to a new anchorage. This is a lovely spot called Telashika. And we're just gonna celebrate the end of three days of storm. When we reach the shore, we meet Croatian-born Leo Spralja from oh, Toronto. Leo wants to show us this sea worm he's hill. caught. Careful, he bites Leo. How long is it? This is one. How many do you have in there? <laughs> one. This is one worm. That's one what? worm. There's one worm. The head, the head, there's right the head. There. Right here. He'll come up. He'll come oh, up. Oh, yeah. Come on, baby. Oh, oh, God. So an, oh here it is. Wait, wait. <laughs> I, I get it. Ew. Oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> Is He's this the, the head bottom, here? Right here. Oh, there right it is. There. Oh, how am I going to grab it? Which one is it now? Here. Here, okay, go. It is, it is. Ew, I don't want to okay, touch it. it. It's that one, that one, that one. Yeah, yeah that yeah. one, that one. Oh, yeah, this is little uh, oh, yeah. antenna. Yeah, yeah like that's yeah, totally, to totally prehistoric. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, it's like a slug, but a yeah. humongous <laughs> slug. <laughs> that's so nasty. That's like tapeworm. Very nasty. Tapeworm, yeah. Yes. So on my next dive, I'm on the lookout for anything that looks like that sea worm. But instead, I find the most enormous mussel I've ever seen and discover there's a whole bed of them beneath the boat. They're almost a meter long and stand up vertically in the weed to filter feed on the nutrients passing through them in the currents. Really interesting. That is quite an animal there. He's, I mean, they're almost a meter long. You can see how big some of those guys are. That's called a fan mussel, the largest bivalve in the Mediterranean, which I think means just a shell, shellfish that has two shells, kind of like a mussel. It's exactly like a mussel, just absolutely enormous. And it's weird, they, they seem to be able to see, I don't know if you could see, but they seem to be able to detect when I was getting closer, even when I'm this far away, and I don't know how they would do that. There's still some life in the old Mediterranean yet. Are you interested in the cruising lifestyle? Are you planning to sail away on a cruising adventure? Or researching cruising areas and destinations? Distant Shores is a television series about the cruising life with lots of tips for sailors planning to sail away. This is Oswego, New York. We are entering the Erie Canal system and this will take us all the way from Lake Ontario to the Hudson River, which gets us to New York City. Plus destination information to help you make your cruising plans. Yeah, I can stand on the bottom. We've been filming Distant Shores for nearly 15 years and know the fun and challenges of the cruising life. We've made distant chores with you in mind. We include plenty of cruising tips in this travel series, as well as lifestyle segments and hints for sailors heading to exotic destinations. Encouragement for you and your crew to get out cruising. Destinations include the Intracoastal Waterway, the Bahamas, Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Scandinavia, transatlantic passage making, the French canals, and more. One of the 
the great things about cruising here are all the lovely little restaurants tucked away. And today we're in a very special place with a famous local chef, Goran. Thank you very much for having us today. Thank you. And I understand you're preparing a traditional dish. Could you tell us what we've got in store? This is what uh, we make now. It's a uh, typical food uh, from this part island here. When we have some uh, fest, uh, some friends, mm -hmm. then we prepare lamb. Uh, we call it uh, lamb on chichi. Oh. It's uh, lamb with uh, olive oils uh, and some onions and a little bit salt, white wine and nothing more. Uh, it must cook to minimum one and a half till two hours in a sl in slow fire. Slow fire. And that's why I think when we'd be uh, finished, you will taste and you can Sounds see wonderful. what, yes, yeah. And now, uh, uh, for preparing this food, we need three hours from start to the serve on table. Three hours is a little, a little bit, yes, like in microwave, yeah. <laughs> I call this system a uh, fire microwave. And uh, uh, when uh, this ash, we put this, then inside is a little bit fresher or uh, vapor. If we don't put that, then it's going, vapor is going out and it's very dry. Uh, so but that's the reason it. why uh, the food is so uh, softly, so... Uh, Tender yes, and moist. Yes, yes. Mm. You will see later. So it's sealed. Before I was working in a school, like a technical school, like professor, because I'm diploming engineer of electronic. And uh, before the war, I have also a private firm for industrial electronics. But how is in Yugoslavia everything gone down? Yes. Then I decided in the war to come here in my switch house and open the restaurant. Uh, this uh, this part of Croatian coast, uh, I think uh, it's nice for the people which is uh, not professional sailors to come here, enjoy with the family, to take char charter boat or something, and that's that's nice. While dinner's cooking, Leo and his wife take us for a scenic drive. So we're taking you up to the uh, army station where during World War II there was a huge lookout for the Germans, German ships. But uh, it's a great lookout. If they had a restaurant up there, I think it would flourish. It would be an amazing thing. <laughs> So it has arrived. Look at all this good food. Sorry not to wait for you. We couldn't wait to start. But uh, there's plenty of meat, as you can see. Two serving plates here and all these lovely roast potatoes. And what's the verdict, everybody? Oh, delicious. <laughs> Well, what do you think, everybody? Did Goran make the right decision to give up his job teaching and start a restaurant? Pretty nice work when your customers become friends. Well, we got our Yugo wind after all, exactly as forecast. Wind coming up from the southeast. We're heading north up the coast, but in the Adriatic the forecasts are pretty good and the winds are pretty stable, so we've had the whole day the wind exactly the same, about 10 to 15 knots out of the southeast. This is the life. But our adventures in Croatia aren't over. Next, we'll be taking you to Starigrad for a week-long sailor's rendezvous and to explore the island of Havar. Thanks for watching this video from way back in the early days of Distant Shores. If you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up, and also don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on upcoming videos. The British Virgin Islands have got to be about the best destination we have ever seen for a tropical sailing vacation. For a week or two charter holiday, these compact sailing grounds have it all. Start.